right? Good afternoon. So, uh, it's a pleasure to be back here after quite some time actually, more than uh, typical. I'll talk about an ongoing project which is uh, dark energy perturbations beyond the perturbative regime. So, trying to look at it as exactly as we can. So, we know that dynamical dark energy must cluster. This follows from the equivalence principle and uh, perturbative calculations which have been done by many people, they show that the growth of fluctuations in dark energy is strongly suppressed at uh, small scales, though these can be fairly significant at larger scales. Now, people have tried to understand what happens at smaller scales because uh, at small scales we know dark matter fluctuations are highly nonlinear and uh, density contrasts of a few thousand are not uh, unseemly. So, clearly perturbative calculations may or may not hold at that stage. And in order to keep the treatment simple, people have tried to work with uh, spherical collapse. So, people have made Newtonian or post-Newtonian models. So, there are two types of models over here. In one set, people try to look at uh, uniform dark energy, energy density, uh, just taking into account the expansion factor. And in other models, they do allow dark energy to cluster as well. No, that will not. So, what we do is to set, it a, set up a fully relativistic uh, set of equations for studying a quintessence model of uh, dark energy. And we work specifically, at least in what I am showing you here, with the thawing models in this study. Thawing models are those where the effective equation of state parameter W starts out very close to minus 1. So, it is lambda-like in the past, but it goes away from that. W becomes larger as you get towards the present day. And we study the evolution of the system in both underdense and overdense regions. And we assume that there is an initial matter perturbation, but there is no initial perturbation in dark energy. So, these are the equations. So, we have the metric, the field equations, and the quintessence field. So, this is uh, tolman bondi metric, and these are the equations for the metric coefficients. There are two unknown coefficients, B and R, and then we have the scalar field, quintessence field, psi, equation of motion for that is given by this. So, we have three second order nonlinear coupled partial differential equations. It is a difficult system of equations to work with and uh, numerics essentially held us back for quite some time. In fact, this project started long ago when Asim was a PhD student and uh, he wrote down the first set of equations, but we ran into difficulties and I revisited this uh, starting about a year and a half ago. So, what we have used for the potential V over here is uh, psi square and e to the minus psi. And in order to fix constants, we start with uh, the field at rest. So, psi dot is 0, which is fine for thawing models because you start at w of minus 1. And uh, we set the present epoch to have omega nr of 0.3 and omega psi of 0.7 for the background FRW model. So, even though we are dealing with a perturbation here at large r, we go asymptotically to a FRW model. And first, we solve for that that allows us to set the initial conditions for dark energy. For dark matter, we need to add some perturbation, otherwise we will essentially be doing a very expensive calculation of an FRW metric. So, we come up, we came up with this description of the initial density uh, contrast for dark matter, where we take two functions d1, d2 and subtract these two out. The subtraction is done to ensure that the density contrast is compensated. At large r, there is no uh, carried over density contrast and we go smoothly to an FRW universe. D i is delta i 1 minus r square by r i square whole square for r less than equal to r i and is 0 beyond that. 
So what we do is we choose R1 and R2 by hand. Delta 1 is chosen by requiring a specific linearly extrapolated value at the center. And then delta 2 follows from the requirement that it must be a compensated uh, system. The initial velocities are set to match the Hubble velocities in the corresponding FRW model. So this, all of this together fixes R, B and their first time derivatives. So these are the results. Uh, so what I am showing he you here is uh, for uh, there is an over density where R1 is 3 megaparsecs, R2 is 18 megaparsecs. So you could think of it as a cluster like uh, over density. Plots over here, uh, so this system we realize is somewhere around a shift of a half. So the plot, the curves over here are for the times before this particular collapse. You can see dark matter density uh, contrast as a function of R. The density contrast decreases as we go from A of 0 0.05 redshift of about 20 to about redshift of half. And you can see that the values here are uh, very close to where you would expect virialization in an Einstein Sitter universe. In fact, this is just a shade before we first uh, hit virialization. It's shown for both the potentials, exponential potential on the left and psi square potential on the right. You don't see any significant difference. There are some subtle differences here, but nothing very significant. This is density contrast for dark energy at different epochs. Again, the same set of epochs. And you can see that the density contrast in dark energy is extremely small. It's increasing as we go to later and later times in response to the dark matter density contrast, which is there. But it is very, very insignificant. It's much smaller than 1. Initial evolution for both the models is self-similar. But you can see that the last two epochs shown over here for both of these potentials, you break away from self-similarity. So something interesting, something nonlinear is happening here. Uh, I'll come to that, yeah, because we are getting, uh, essentially we have, uh, this is happening at a scale of around one and a half to two megaparsecs. This is where your density profile has the highest gradient. And uh, in case you did not mug up the equations, uh, the relevant part over here comes from the gradients. So there is. That will also set a scale, but that scale itself is not relevant, which you can see by just comparing these two plots. This is for the exponential potential, and this is for the phi square potential. You can see that perturbations are somewhat higher for the phi square potential, somewhat a little bit lower for the exponential potential. If you look at the equation of state uh, parameter w, again the same set of epochs, you see that it starts out near minus 1, is gradually increasing, but it is increasing a little bit more in the overdense regions. So now the equation of state parameter is a function of position. It is related to the local over density. And uh, the differential between the compensated part out here, so beyond 18 megaparsecs, this is a fully compensated system. And inside the main halo, which is at 3 megaparsecs, you can see that there is some differential. Again, the differential is much stronger in case of the phi square potential as compared to the exponential potential. So this is all that happens before the system virializes. And in that regime, our calculations are exact. How do we now say that the system has virialized? How do we claim that the system has virialized? So we fall back to the original definition, which you will find in books in classical mechanics. And uh, if you follow these, then for Einstein de Sitter and Lambda CDM, you can get a closed form expression for R virial in terms of R turnaround, which is the maximum radius that the perturbation reaches. But in our case, there is no closed form expression which you can find. Oh, yeah, sorry. 
equal to 0 is missing. Thanks for pointing it out. So we cannot find a closed form expression for our case and what we do is that uh, since we are evolving shells, we follow each shell closely after turnaround and uh, the moment this becomes equal to 0 for that shell, we say that this particular shell has now virialized. At that stage, we, what we do is we depart from the system of equations which we had and uh, we freeze the metric coefficients b and r set b dot r dot equal to 0, but psi is still there. So what we do is that we treat psi as being a test field in this fixed space time background inside the virialized region. We just let it evolve. The test for this being a reasonable assumption would be that rho d e must be less than rho d m in this region always. If that is not true, then the assumption is not fine. Does that mean shells are much, much smaller than shells are dm? No. So See, en en energy density in, in the test field must be much smaller than the field which is driving the space time. So solutions outside this region remain self-consistent and we do not break or try to match. We evaluate derivatives as they are. So now again looking at the dark matter density profile, density contrast profile and this is at uh, A of 0.7 up to point, uh, 1.0. So we are at redshifts lower than half. You can see a kink over here okay? and this kink corresponds to the virialization scale. And you can see that the virialization happens at a density contrast of above 200 and then this gradually moves up. Density contrast here is defined as uh, rho matter divided by rho matter average minus 1, not as rho matter by rho c minus 1. So that is a difference from uh, a convention which you will find in many papers. So this seems to be reasonable. If you compare numbers with lambda CDM, we are not way off. And this is the test of the assumption rho d e by rho d m. And you can see that at larger scales, dark energy dominates, but at smaller scales, so this particular curve refers to this epoch, okay, which is 0.4 before virialization. So these are the two curves which are post virialization and in both of these cases, the uh, rho d e by rho d m inside the virial radius is less than a few percent same for the exponential and the pi square potentials. This is the equation of state parameter and now you can see that something crazy is going on. You begin to see these strange oscillations. So as you approach the virial radius from outside, W increases. This is what we saw even in the pre-virialization uh, epochs. But now you see that somewhere around the virial radius, there is a break and then there are oscillations over here. And W inside the halo can become fairly large, going well above minus 0.95, when in the background you are at a number like minus 0.97. Okay. So the offset between the equation of state parameter can be large. And this is the density contrast for dark energy at various epochs. And you can see that this can become large. There is a, again an offset between exponential and phi square potentials, but it is fairly reasonable. It remains of the order of about a percent or two percent at best. So this was for a halo, cluster-like halo, which collapses at redshift of a half. What happens if the collapse happens earlier? Which means the test field inside the virial halo will have a longer time to evolve. This is for a halo which collapses at redshift of one and a half, not at half. Same set of curves, but now change how the scale on the y-axis has changed. And you find density contrasts for exponential potential, you go above one, and for the phi square potential, you go well above 10. So 
fluctuations, perturbations in dark energy can become fairly significant over here. Equation of state parameter can become positive, can approach 1, which means the field inside is becoming kinetic energy dominated. Now, you would have thought that if the field is becoming kinetic energy dominated, its energy density will diminish very rapidly. But remember, we are not in an expanding region over here. This is static. So, it has no obvious implications for how the energy density would evolve. But the ratio of energy densities does remain small at all of these scales. So, the test field approximation is reasonably valid. This is all for an overdense region. Now, let us look at what happens in an underdense region. This is an underdensity. You can see dark matter density contrast starts out at around minus 0 0.3, 0 0.4 at redshift of uh, 4 and then gradually it comes down up to around minus 0 0.7 something. Similar again for the exponential and the phi square potentials. This is the dark energy density contrast. This is the equation of state parameter. Now, here you have an under density in matter and inside the under density, the equation of sta state parameter is evolving slower as compared to the background. So, in voids, you find that the equation of state parameter is closer to minus 1. It is more lambda like whereas the background has a w which is higher. So, there is this offset between the two regimes. No, not in scalar field, no, unless you have an unconventional uh, kinetic energy thrown in. This is the ratio of energy densities. Here the ratio is fairly high mainly because it is a matter under density and uh, therefore, dark energy begins to dominate. It is not that the density contrast in dark energy is high, that if you recall is fairly small. Now, this is a plot for the phi psi square potential. I have removed the exponential potential. What I am showing is what happens when we tweak the scales of relevance. So, R 1 here is 15 megaparsecs and 30 for the one on left and 6 and 18 for one on the right. And what you find is that qualitatively there is no significant difference. You basically have a step. The magnitude of the step is slightly different not a whole lot when you look at the equation of state parameter. This is the density contrast for dark energy. Again, you find that there is no significant qualitative difference between these two, which means that the scale of perturbation, we have changed the scale of perturbation from 6 megaparsecs to 15 megaparsecs, more than doubled, and it has not resulted in any significant change over here, which means the scale somehow is not playing a serious role in the evolution of dark energy perturbations. And this is uh, dark matter density contrast in these two cases. So, this is the brief summary. Dark energy perturbations remain subdominant at small scales, even when the dark matter perturbations are nonlinear. And this happens as the product of rho d e mod delta d e this always remains much smaller than rho d m mod delta d m, even though density contrast in dark energy can be very large. And dark energy perturbations depend, their uh, amplitude depends on the choice of the potential. Changes in the equation of state parameter w in overdense and underdense regions may offer a way to probe the nature of dark energy. This could happen via something like lensing or this could happen via something more exotic because in many models the, uh, uh, the constants, the coupling constants are related with the uh, quintessence potential. It is curious that the change of scale of perturbation does not change the behavior very significantly and it is also curious that the somewhat rapid growth of perturbations in dark energy within the virialized halo do not leak out to the 
larger scales. Now, this is very different from what people who have worked with fluid models for dark energy find. What they do is that they assume some equation of state parameter and they assume that the, there is a speed of sound associated with this fluid, which is diff C s square is not same as W. They take C s square to be of order C square. And when they do that, they find that whenever there is a collapse of dark matter, dark energy tends to, uh, the dark energy density contrast tends to increase over there and then this diffuses out to larger scales. So we are not seeing that so far. Now what we are doing right now is that we are working on tabulating variation of uh, the virial density contrast scale of uh, the, uh, the radius of virialized objects as functions of mass. Same for turnaround radius, R turnaround with the choice of potential and epoch of collapse and compare that with the lambda CDM case. Uh, so this is the work uh, done with uh, Manavendra Pratap Rajvanshi, who is a student. He was our own uh, BSMS student and he started this work for his master's thesis and he has continued as a PhD student over there. So I stop here. Thank you. considered testing this idea with local dynamics or maybe with large clusters of galaxies because the outer regions are still collapsing. Right. So it might be possible. Yeah. So that essentially will partly be revealed in uh, these, the variation of these quantities with the, the, with the scalar field model and so on. So after that we will go on to look at uh, dynamics. We have not done that yet. Yeah, because in, you can in principle make a prediction. Yes. That the dynamic, the effective potential inside the cluster has changed. Yes. And it's a function of radius. Which yes. You can sort of predict. But if you, uh, if I go back to. How much difference does it uh, make actually? I just. Uh, no. So this is the critical plot. Mm. See, dark energy density is extremely subdominant in the inner regions. It's only in the boundary region that we have some some chance. So that's and why that, large that's clusters of galaxies now there are a few cases where they reach out. To yeah. the background density, they, they, they can't reach that far, but still. Right. And in those uh, things are still collapsing. They haven't been realized yet. Yeah. So that is the boundary. Where that is the boundary move. region where we may be able to say something. I'm not sure whether dynamics or lensing, weak lensing will play a more important role. We have to work that out. We have not done that yet. Yeah, weak lensing, there may be other degeneracies. Anyway. Yeah, to follow up on this about observational signatures of this, at the time when we looked at it with Maor, we thought maybe it could be some effect on in the press sector yes. formalism because yes. if our veer, veer is different, it propagates to the mass uh, function. Right. Uh, but you know, the effect is not dramatic compared with all the other systematics no. uh, observationally. Right. But you just alluded to, say, uh, lensing. So are you thinking about actually looking at a particular object or something more I statistical think, uh, in an ensemble? Okay, so these are preliminary thoughts, but uh, essentially the lensing contribution of dark energy is concentrated in the region going up to R virial and maybe a little bit beyond if you push to weak lensing. The lensing potential has a contribution from the equation of state parameter. How it behaves as a function of R, even if you take the dark energy to be uniform. So here we are saying, seeing that it is non-uniform. But even if it were to be uniform, in that case, there is contribution from the equation of state parameter. And uh, that is something which we may be able to probe, particularly for things which collapsed early, because there we are seeing a very large differential in equation of state parameter from the core of the cluster to the outside region. Very interesting stuff. The, I, I have two quick questions. The first you almost certainly said, but I might have missed it. What was the initial condition for W that you were implementing here? Minus one. Minus one. So I thought that at minus one you, uh, you answered a question earlier as well that you don't get any change. So we are not taking, uh, we are not fixing W to be minus one. We are taking initial conditions to the, for, for the scalar field to be that it starts at rest. So if the kinetic energy is zero, the effective W is minus one. But since it's a dynamical system which is giving us dark energy, it will evolve away from minus one and begin to cluster. Okay. Is there a reason to expect that it would have no 
fluctuations intrinsically apart like apart from the fact that so you're starting it it, it, it could yeah. but uh, even in the perturbation calculations which people have done what they find is that even if they start with no perturbations in dark energy then very quickly you get to the uh, uh, adiabatic limit of proportionality between uh, dark energy density contrast and dark matter density contrast at large scales so we expect that this is a reasonably safe initial condition to start with instead of imposing something in the beginning because then we'll have to worry about how much of what we are getting in the end is because of what we put in in the beginning okay let's thank jajit once again for his talk well, since i have saved up on time let me just say that uh, we sorry well, I'll pass forward some of the time, but uh, thanking Paddy and uh, how he has dealt with students and trained us and uh, how that has had an impact on uh, all of us as scientists. He always tries to push you to do more and more, to do better and better, which can dri drive you up a wall. <laughs> so sometimes it can be quite exasperating. And uh, towards the end of my thesis was one such phase. It was not helped by the fact that uh, all of my simulation data was lost <laughs> by an overzealous sweeper who thought that there was some dirt under a box. So he picked it up to clean it. It was a bunch of hard disks which was churning. And uh, so I had to rerun all the simulations in order to get the data. So in order to improve things, what Paddy will say is, you know, thesis should have more stuff as compared to your papers. Okay. So you do that. And then there are a couple of papers which are being written along with the thesis. And then he says, you know, papers should have more stuff than the thesis. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well. Well, it, it worked well. Uh, I sneakily put in, uh, in my acknowledgement in the thesis, thanking Paddy for thought-provoking discussions. He never asked what those thoughts were. Uh, we kind of <laughs> lucked it at that. Thank you, Paddy. So our last speaker before the break is Harvinder.